folks, it's Miss Sinclair for AP World History Modern. Today we are going to be continuing our Unit 6 lectures. Now Unit 6 looks at the consequences of industrialization and we are going to be looking at the scramble for Africa. So I want you to think back, what are the motivations for new imperialism? What makes it different from our first wave of imperialism? The name of today's notes are the Scramble for Africa. This aligns with topic 6.3 of our AP course description. So our topic is indigenous responses to state expansion. And our objective is you will be able to explain how and why internal and external factors have influenced the process of state building from 1750 to 1900. So what do I mean when I say the scramble for Africa? Well, this is a term commonly used in history classes, especially um, for the sudden wave of conquests in Africa by European powers in the 1880s and 1890s. We see that Britain will obtain most of East Africa, France, Northwestern Africa, and then Germany, Belgium, Portugal, Italy, and Spain will all acquire lesser amounts. It is useful to note um, this political cartoon, right? So this is a really common one. You're going to see um, it is obviously not an English cartoon, right? Um, it's French or Belgian, um, but um, what's the message of this? When you see these images on the slides, political cartoons, pieces of art, uh, maps, graphs, you should try to think of them a little bit in terms of our source analysis. You know, do we know who made it? What's the purpose of this? What's it trying to communicate? Who is the audience of it? it what's the central message of this? Right? We know that source-based questions will include sources that are text, but also visual, political cartoons, um, graphs. You will see a source on at least um, two of your SAQs on the AP test. And then, of course, you have your DBQ, your document-based question. So this political cartoon is critiquing European imperialism. Right? It's saying that, look, they're just dividing up Africa like a piece of cake. Which piece do you want? And the different gentlemen at the table represent different European countries based on their facial hair. So let's look at a map. You guys know I'm a geography teacher as well. And so I always love a good map. In 1880, this is what... Africa looked like, right? You didn't have a lot of large empires. And we've talked about why that is before. In part, Africa's geography just has not lent itself to empire building, right? You have the Sahara Desert right through here, right? So that's gonna act as a physical boundary. Um, you have dense jungles through here. You have mountain ranges, right? The Ethiopian highlands. Um, like here's Lake Victoria. And so like Uganda is like right around here. And so very mountainous. And then over here, it's much more dry and arid. Right down here, you have another desert. So geography doesn't lend itself to empire building. You also have so much diversity within Africa. Different languages, ethnic groups. Um, food sources, cultures, it's, you don't have, um, a sense of unity across regions either. So a couple things to note about our geography, you have the Nile river, which is like right here. Blah, 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 blah. And if you remember, it flows northward, right? You're also going to have, um, some major rivers in Congo and, near like what's not in day Nigeria, and they also flow towards the sea. Not super useful if you are trying to um, 
get to the interior of Africa. So in 1880, you have um, Egypt, um, which is part of the Ottoman Empire. Um, Ethiopia is still independent. You have multiple sultanates, right? So these sultanates are all part of our Indian Ocean trade system. We know that North Africa in general tends to be Muslim. Um, you have the Sokoto Caliphate, um, lots of city-states um, here. Um, we have a few colonies, right? Congo owned by France, Angola, which is um, Portugal's like humane source of slaves, Algeria owned by the French, the Cape Colony, which was originally Dutch and then became British. But for the most part, you have lots of independent um, European or uh, independent African states and then lots of small communities, right? Well, by 1914, right, 34 years later, you can see how much of Africa has been encompassed by European colonies. Um, the um, northern part of Africa is really encompassed by France, which is why in um, so much of West Africa and in Northern Africa, Fran French is a lingua franca. Um, the British take huge swaths of East Africa. Uh, and again, if you go to Uganda, right, um, one of the lingua francas is English because they were occupied by the British. You see that um, the Belgians have Congo. We'll talk about what they do there. It's horrific. One of the only independent state will be Ethiopia. Um, yeah, Liberia is its own thing. Um, Ethiopia is under... Um, African rule, and it will remain so until Mussolini. So this is a great video. Um, it will show you year by year the colonization of Africa, and so you can see on the map how the borders change. It's really pretty neat. So all of this colonization happens in the Berlin Conference. The Berlin Conference of 1884 is really important for you to know. Like that's a turning point in imperial history. So the Berlin Conference is going to be organized by Otto von Bismarck. So you can see there's Otto. Um, and in fact, the dude with the mustache, Otto von Bismarck of Germany. We'll talk about German unification um, later this unit, I believe, or beginning of next unit. I can't remember. Um, at the Berlin Conference, they will partition Africa into colonies controlled by Belgium, France, Germany, Great Britain, Italy, Portugal, and Spain. Liberia and Ethiopia will not be colonized. Um, South Africa was already British. Here's the thing. You literally have representatives from those European states I mentioned. They sit around at a table in Berlin in 1884 with a giant map of Africa in between and just divide it up. Right? If you've um, had me for human geography, you perhaps remember the video clip I showed um, with John Stewart and John Oliver, um, Sir Maps a lot. Right? It's a clip from the Daily Show from several years ago, and how it's like, oh well, pish posh, we just gotta draw these straight lines and you know divide up the land. That's what they did. They just sat there and said, like, oh, what part do you want? Well, I want that part. Oh, I want this part. No Africans were present at this conference. None were even invited. And the divisions were really made without concern for ethnic or cultural groups. So they are just gonna like get a ruler, you know, have a nice straight line. So because these divisions were made without ethnic or cultural groups consulted or even considered, we're going to see that traditional African communities will be really disruptive. Allies will be cut in half. Tribes will be cut in half. Um, communities will be cut off from their water source, from holy sites, from their farmland. 
historical enemies will be grouped together and expected to be allies and to share a sense of loyalty and companionship. There's no attempt to understand the people groups and accommodate them, which is really interesting when you consider that in Africa, in the same time period, you have a growing sense of nationalism, right? With um, a sense of we are Italian and this is who it means to be Italian and we're going to be a single unified Italian state and in Germany and in the Balkans. So you have nationalism in Europe, the sense of this is who we are and we don't want to be grouped together with people who are different from us. And yet, hypocritically, they do exactly that in Africa. So all of Africa will be partitioned into European colonies. And Europeans needed to colonize Africa um, and needed to modernize it, um, since the quotations around that word, um, to suit their imperial and industrial needs, right? They need raw materials and they need markets because of the Industrial Revolution. Growing white racial supremacy and a European confidence in their civilizing process will motivate this as well. You can see a direct link between the colonization in Africa and why state building in Africa in the 20th century and 21st century has been so mired in corruption and difficulty. Right? African state building efforts were hindered by the persistence of political boundaries inherited from the colonial era. So in West Africa, let's see, do I have a slide for this? Yeah. So in West Africa, we're going to see European rulers will take advantage of the traditional trade networks in place. Um, they will tax merchants and farmers. They'll invest in railroads and harbors and grow cotton, peanuts, and cocoa. In equatorial Africa, right, right along the equator, you have less trade and less population density. Again, Africa is hugely diverse. You have over 3,000 distinct ethnic groups, over 2,000 distinct languages. That's not even accounting for different dialects. And Africans are more genetically diverse from one another than Chinese are from Europeans. So in West Africa, we see Muslim states, right? Um, they, um, you have the Hausa peoples in Nigeria, the Sokoto Caliphate. Um, these Muslim states that were formed um, in the early 19th century, right? The Sokoto Caliphate was formed in 1809, um, will expand to conquer so-called pagan states, the states around them, the territories around them that were not Muslim. And they did this um, through jihad, holy war. Now, jihad is a really loaded word, um, and it's been interpreted in different ways. Um, some historians and experts will say that it is best described, best translated as like holy struggle, um, not so much war, but we know that historically, and in even today's world, people interpret it as meaning violence, as meaning war. And that's the definition I'm going to work off of because that's how, how the Sokoto Caliphate would have um, described it themselves. So in these new Muslim states, you have um, centers for learning and reform, madrasas, schools for boys would be opened, um, like our original caliphates, um, non-Muslims have to pay a tax. And during the jihads, those who resisted would be killed, enslaved, or forced to convert. Those who were enslaved would be sold into the trans-Saharan slave trade. In South Africa, you already had some white settlers, right? So in the 16th century, Bantu-speaking peoples occupied the eastern regions of Southern Africa. They practiced agriculture, herding, um, metallurgy with iron and copper. In 1652, 
Cape of Good Hope was established as a Dutch colony for ships sailing to Asia. It was an important stopping point to get water and provisions. It was originally dependent on slave labor brought from Asia, but quickly turned towards African labor. And even under the Dutch rule, you had lots of competition and warfare with the indigenous African communities. By 1800, there are 17,000 white settlers and 26,000 slaves. So the Boers um, are these white settlers, these Dutch settlers, who will gradually move into the interior of South Africa from the coastlines. So the Boers are the term we use to refer to the people who are being born and raised in South Africa. Yes, they're white. Yes, historically they may have come from um, Holland, but you know, they are not European. In the same way, you might trace your ancestry back to Europe or um, Guatemala, but you would probably describe yourself first as an American or the way that the um, Creoles in the Castus system in Latin America, right? Born and raised in Bolivia, but of European descent. Same idea. So the Boers enslaved indigenous peoples um, and would um, intermix with them as well. Um, typical examples of... Um, sexual slavery and um, rape among slave women. So um, mixed race people would emerge. After the British took Cape Colony, many Boers would flee um, and would really resist um, British rule. So in, let's see, where do I have? No, nope. okay. In uh, 1834, you have what's known as the Great Trek when Boers migrate further into the interior of South Africa, um, trying to escape, essentially, British rule. It's not that the British were oppressing them. The Boers didn't want to um, have, um, have anything to do with them. So you had the Boer, um, Boer Wars, right? The wars between the British and the Boers. And once the fighting started, our first concentration camps, frankly, were um, the British um, keeping the Boers in concentration camps in South Africa. And as the Boers fled into the interior of Africa, they will encounter other African peoples like the Zulu. So the Zulu's people will fight the Boers and then the Zulu's will fight the British. So the Zulu people are a people group found in sort of what's modern day South Africa. Um, in 1818, this group was united under King Shaka and Shaka was really a military genius. He made the Zulu a really aggressive people, um, very feared warriors. He expanded their kingdom by raiding neighbors and capturing women and children this would create refugees. So in fact, neighboring Africans would create their own states and these states would serve as safe havens for these refugees. One of these would be Lesotho. So Lesotho, which if you remember from a map, is located in the center of um, South Africa. If you were, we're gonna look at a physical map of South Africa, you would see that the territory that Lesotho occupies is really mountainous, these incredibly high mountains. And this geographic feature will protect them from the Zulu peoples, but it will also make them a really great haven for refugees fleeing Zulu wars. The Zulu kingdom is a great example of creating a African identity right? A cohesive identity, um, apart from just tribal, right? He's, he's trying to create a state here. Um, and he's trying to create a national identity. 
So Shaka Zulu will rule from 1816 to 1828. He will be the Nguni leader of the Zulu kingdom. And in 1818, he will begin what he calls the African unification process. So he absorbs his neighbors to build resistance against the British. So the state that emerges is Mfenke, and I forgive my pronunciation. It's a period of chaos among indigenous African communities in Southern Africa with multiple civil wars and chaos between the tribes. This will be followed shortly after Um, by the Anglo-Zulu Wars, which will be an ongoing conflict between the British Empire and the Zulu Kingdom. The um, Anglo-Zulu Wars will actually be where a young Winston Churchill really gets his start. He'll he'll be there as a journalist. It's not a fair fight in some ways, Um, right? The British have machine guns, they have trains, they have better provisions and weapons. However, the Zulu aren't massacred immediately, right? They um, have some wins, like the Battle of Isandlwana, and um, they will um, prove to be a really fearsome enemy against the British. But ultimately, the war will result in a British victory, and an end to the Zulu kingdom's independence. Um, They made a movie called Zulu, and um, this video clip by the history buffs um, looks at the movie and sort of looks at the historical accuracy of it. So when we talk about modernization in Africa, it's kind of a loaded term, right? What do we mean when when something becomes modern? Modernization is the process of reforming political, military, economic, social, and cultural traditions into an imitation of the early success of Western societies, often with little regard for accommodating the local traditions in non-Western societies. So here's the question I'd like to pose to you, and I don't have an answer for it. Can you modernize without Westernizing? Right? Think about the things that we consider to be modern. Um, universal education. Sure, I mean, that seems like a, a no-brainer. But what do the schools look like? The schools look like kids sitting in classes facing a teacher who um, instructs them from the blackboard, right? It's The universal education seems sort of culturally neutral, but if you look at how the schools are set up, they're set up like European schools, by set up like Western schools. Um, urbanization, right? S- large cities. Well, again, there's lots of urban centers that existed before European intervention in um, different parts of the world. Look at Tenochtitlan, look at um, Baghdad, right? China, Urbanization is a sort of culturally neutral thing. But do we consider these cities to be modern? Or do we consider a city to be modern when it starts to have skyscrapers, when it starts to have sewer systems, when it has streets that are laid out in a grid and um, public transportation? See, what does it mean to modernize? And can you modernize without westernizing? It's an ongoing question, and it's one that developing countries continue to grapple with, right? They want to maintain their unique cultural identity. However, they also want to be able to participate in the global economy. So this question was being grappled with even in the 19th century. In Algeria... The French will invade in 1830, and the Algerians don't just take it, right? You have an 18-year-long war. The French ultimately win this war of attrition by destroying farms, slaughtering 
animals, burning crops, and massacring villagers by the tens of thousands. Ultimately, the Algerians will surrender. But in the mountains, you will still have resistance movements for 30 years. You have um, Egypt, which we've talked about before, right? Muhammad Ali um, tries to modernize Egypt um, by creating its own industrial economy based on cotton. But the British strong arm at their way into killing that economy, right? The um, burgeoning Egyptian industrial process can't compete with the already established um, businesses in Britain. And so the Egyptians will be stuck just growing and exporting cotton um, as a raw material. Population will increase. Um, and you do see some attempts at investment in local infrastructure. One of the other things we see during this time period, during this Victorian era, is sort of this age of exploration, right? You have all of these European adventurers, explorers, going to the untouched parts of the world and writing about what they experienced. One of the main ways that these groups were funded was through private geographic societies. Think about like National Geographic. The National Geographic Society is an actual society. And it started um, with some of these aims to fund people going around and exploring the world. So these geographic societies were interested in minerals, botany, animals, mapping, and evangelism as well. So one of these famous explorers is David Livingston. David Livingston will explore Southern and Central Africa. He's Scottish and a missionary doctor, which means he's going around serving as a doctor first and then also telling people about Jesus second. He was really warmly accepted where he went because he, it was really clear that he was just exploring, right? He wasn't seeking to conquer, exploit for economic reasons. He was clearly not a threat, right? He was just a curious guy. Because communication infrastructure from Sub-Saharan Africa back to Europe was questionable at best, Livingston goes missing. And there becomes um, this big question of like, where's David Livingston? Henry Morgan Stanley begins exploring with the explicit effort of finding David Livingston. And he will do so by fighting his way across the continent, right? Using violence. When he eventually finds David Livingston, he, um, he is quoted as saying, Dr. Livingston, I presume. Um, if you ever hear that reference, this is what it's in reference to. But David Livingston is like, I'm not lost. I know exactly where I am. Sorry, my letters got lost in the mail, but you didn't need to come looking for me. So one of the reasons why you want to have the rivers of Africa mapped, one of the reasons why you want to know about the minerals and animals is for economic exploitation, right? The discovery of rivers invites trade. So Africa will begin to export vegetable oils, gold, ivory, and other goods. You have to remember as well, the 19th century has abolitionism, right? So the British are the most aggressive when it comes to the abolition of slavery. They will use their navy to patrol the African coast to stop slave ships. But Cuba and Brazil will continue to import slaves until the late 19th century. And the trans-Saharan um, slave trade will continue on as well. You do have legitimate trade. Old exports will be revived like palm oil. The Niger Delta um, will use um, local slaves to um, produce palm oil. Sierra Leone is a territory owned by the British. And when the British caught slave ships, they would drop the slaves off there. This is one of the reasons why 
the capital of Sierra Leone is Freetown. Liberia is um, a state that was settled by African Americans. There was actually a brief back to Africa movement in the United States um, as free blacks and ex-slaves thought like, why are we sticking around this country? We should go to Africa um, where we were originally from and sort of create our own black United States in Africa. Slaves and ex-slaves from the Americas will settle there as well. So if the British first primary empire is going to be in Asia, right? India um, and the Eastern Hemisphere. Their secondary empire is in Africa. And they're not the only ones. So actually during this time period, we see an increase in the Trans-Saharan slave trade. Um, the clove plantations in Zanzibar um, and Pemba um, set up by local sultans needed labor. Um, the French set up sugar um, and coffee plantations in Mauritius and Réunion. Um, the demand for ivory and the demand for porters, people like these men to carry goods, demanded it. So slaves would go to markets in North Africa and the Middle East. Slaves would also go to the colonies in the Indian Ocean to work on plantations. And within East Africa itself, slaves would be used by the Sultanate of Oman, um, as well as other Sultanates um, along the Red Sea and um, the East African coast. So one of the reasons why we call it a secondary empire is because the British didn't necessarily directly rule all of these places, right? They would pressure and provide for groups ruling in the region, like the Sultanate of Oman. Okay, I mentioned Egypt briefly, but I want to talk about it in a little bit more depth. European involvement in Egypt began when the Egyptians were trying to ditch the Ottoman Empire. Industrialization had caused debt, and to avoid bankruptcy... Egyptians sold shares of the Suez Canal to the UK. So the Suez Canal is going to be built in 1869, and it's so incredibly important for trade, right? It will connect the Mediterranean Sea to the Indian Ocean's trade network, right? It connects the Red Sea to the Mediterranean. So it will shorten the sea voyage from Europe and Asia because you no longer have to sail all the way around Africa. The British will keep control of the Suez Canal and Egypt for 70 years, but they'll rule indirectly, right? They're um, sort of putting up the illusion that the Egyptians have local rule, but really it's the British who are ultimately in charge. Egypt served a strategic political location with East, com Eastern commercial and military links to Europe and the colonies in Asia and Africa, right? Britain needed to keep control of Egypt and the Suez Canal so they could very quickly get to their colonies in India in case of emergency. So There's dilemmas about the West, right? What do you do about the growing power of Europe if you're Egypt, if you are the Middle East, if you're any of these states? Well, option one is to try and take the good stuff um, from the West and use it to your advantage. Um, but that doesn't always work. I mean, look at Muhammad Ali and in Egypt. He tried to modernize and industrialize without westernizing and the British were able to um, force Egypt under their control. Option two would be to reject everything um, that has to do with the West, that has to do with Europe, including industrialization. So,
in Sudan, the region of Sudan, you see that Egyptians will try to conquer and rule in Sudan, but the Sudanese nomadic groups there really resented this. So Muhammad Ahmed the Mahdi will become the leader who will unite the Sudanese to fight back. Ahmad will really proclaim a jihad against the Egyptians and the British. So the Mahdist revolts will result in some Sudanese control. The Mahdists will build a strong state that's very conservative and Muslim. And it becomes a problem for the British. So the British decide to intervene. And they ride against the Sudanese nomadic groups um, with their modern weapons. And these nomadic groups, the Mahdists have camels and swords. And it's not a fight at all. The British used rapid firing rifles and machine guns. The Sudanese had muskets and spears. Within a few hours, over 11,000 Sudanese were dead and only 48 British soldiers were dead. What about in West Africa, specifically the Belgian Congo? So there's a really great book that I haven't read, but I've been meaning to called King Leopold's Ghost. And it's going to really look at sort of the genocide that happens in the Congo. So Belgium's King Leopold II really wanted to exploit the ivory market and rubber exports. And frankly, by the mid 1890s, rubber had become the colony's most profitable industry. So Leopold II was the king of Belgium. However, he had this private sort of colony. Um, he will rule the Congo Free State as well. The um, Under his rule, the native Congolese will be reduced to essentially slaves, um, forced to work at gunpoint. In um, 1887, the invention of inflatable rubber bicycle tubes and the growing popularity of the automobile will greatly increase the global demand for rubber. So that means further exploitation of the workers. Male workers will often be worked to death. Wives and children will be held hostage until men met the quotas. Those who refused or failed to meet their quotas would have their villages burned down, children murdered, and their hands cut off. Local chiefs organized tribal resistance and escape, but I mean, think about what I just said with the British fight with the Sudanese. It was not a fair fight. Between 1885 and 1908, the native Congolese population decreased about by 10 million people. 10 million people. About 6 million people died in the Holocaust, right? 10 million Congolese died in, um, gosh, less than 30 years. Um, it's horrific, right? Murder, starvation, exhaustion, and exposure, disease, plummeting birth rates. It's sort of Africans forgotten genocide. And it's all in an effort for this one guy to make money, right? It's not that Belgium had control over the um, Congo Free State. It was Leopold. And he never visited Congo, ever. He, um, in the end, it'll be the press that brings an end to this. In 1906, the British press started publicizing the horrors. There was also a, uh, less demand for rubber at this point. So the Belgian government will take over Leopold's private empire. The Berlin Conference said that colonizers had to protect native tribes and improve their standard of living, but the Belgians had made it worse. The agreement in Berlin did not include any formal requirement that nations enforce the obligations it established. And so the Congolese will be abused and exploited by the Belgians. So I want to read you a quote that goes along with this image. The photograph is by Alice Seeley Harris, and the man's name is Nasala. 
Here is part of her account from the book, Don't Call Me Lady, The Journey of Lady Alice Seeley Harris. He hadn't made his rubber quota for the day, so the Belgian appointed overseers had cut off his daughter's hand and foot. Her name was Boali. She was five years old. Then they killed her, but they weren't finished. They killed his wife as well, and because that didn't seem quite cruel enough, quite strong enough to make their case, they cannibalized both Boali and her mother. Then they presented Nasala with the tokens, the leftovers from the once living body of his darling child, whom he so loved. His life was destroyed. They had partially destroyed it anyway by forcing his servitude, but this act finished it for him. All of this filth had occurred because of one man, one man who lived thousands of miles across the sea, one man who couldn't get rich enough, who had decreed that his that this land was his and that these people should serve his own greed. Leopold had not given any thought to the idea that these African children, these men and women, were our fully human brothers, created equally by the same hand that had created his own lineage of European royalty. Look at that image. Look what's sitting before him. These are the horrors of the Belgian Congo and King Leopold. All right, let's return to South Africa again. Um, I know this is kind of a long lecture, but it's hugely important, right? We're talking about an entire continent. So the Boer Wars um, will be in the 1850s. The Boers had established two republics, the Orange Free State and Transvaal in the interior. So the Boers will begin to call themselves Afrikaners, and they will hold a lot of political power. In um, 1856, enslaved Africans will begin to um, briefly fight back against the Boers. Um, it's called the um, Sosha Cattle Killing Movement, spelled X-H-O-S-A. And it was led by a woman who um, gathered followers and preached that if they slaughtered all of these cows um, owned by the Dutch, uh, owned by the Afrikaners, um, all of the dead, all of their dead brothers and sisters and loved ones who'd been killed by these European um, descendants would rise from the dead. It didn't work. She was imprisoned. You also have the arrival of Cecil Rhodes in 1867. He's a British businessman who will lead the British arrival when diamonds are discovered in the Orange Free States. So he's a British entrepreneur and politician, and he will be involved in the expansion of the British Empire from South Africa into Central Africa. So it will include Southern and Northern Rhodesia, Southern Rhodesia, which is now Zimbabwe, and Northern Rhodesia, which is now Zim uh, Zambia. And Rhodes believed he was justified in all of his actions because he was bringing Western technology to Africa to help improve it. In 1885, gold was discovered and diamonds as well in the interior. So in 1899 to 1902, you have the Boer Wars. When the Boers declared war on the British for invading their republics and interfering in Boer interests, the British, of course, were... Um, victorious and united those republics into a single South Africa under British control. They'll also begin to bring over Indians from uh, India to work as laborers. So what are some of the political and social consequences of all of this? Well, Africa at the time of European invasion contained a variety of societies. And these societies would respond differently to the European invasions. Some would welcome the Europeans as allies against local enemies. Others resisted European rule. You do also see that pastoral and warrior states like the Zulu and the Nabele 
people resisted European invasion. You'll also see commercial states um, resisting as well, like Asante and Benin. Ethiopia will be the only successful story. Menelik, the emperor of Ethiopia, will be able to fight off the Italian invasion in 1896 and will enlarge Ethiopia to its present dimensions. He purchased Western weapons and defeated the Italians by using a better trained and larger army. Unfortunately, Mussolini in the 1930s will um, bring Ethiopia's independent rule to an end. When you think about life under European rule, most Africans tried to continue living as before, but colonial policies made it really difficult. Rights to land, private property, commercial transactions, legal disputes were all handled really differently under European rule. Traditional rulers lost all their authority. Plus, the colonial emphasis was on the production of cash crops. And so land was assigned to European companies and planters. And so that most fertile land would not be available to grow food to feed the African populations. They would also force Africans to work on these plantations, but would not actually pay them enough to live on. So this created a cycle because they also imposed high taxes. So they forced them to work, paid them very little, and then imposed high taxes, which then the Africans would be unable to pay. It forced African men to take the low pay jobs and to migrate to cities and mining camps in search of work. Some African women welcomed colonial rule because it meant an end to fighting and slave raiding. And we know that women were often used as sexual slaves, um, especially in the trans-Saharan slave network. But women benefited even less than the men did. Many African societies um, allowed women to have property rights, and those rights were undermined by colonial policies that assigned property rights to men only. You should discuss this question. Compare and contrast the colonization in Africa to that in India. All right, last slide. What about the cultural response to all of this? Well, missionaries were the main conduits by which Africans came in contact with European culture. Missionaries would teach both practical skills, um, medicine, um, domestic skills, and Western ideas. As I've said before, missionaries are always a mixed bag. Some of them will go um, with earnestness to help um, Africans, to teach them about Jesus, to love and serve them. Um, And others will um, do more harm than good, frankly. Africans educated in mission schools will find that Christian ideals clashed with the reality of colonial exploitation and will begin to use Christian ideas to critique colonialism. Um, The missionaries were very successful in sub-Saharan Africa. Um, There's an extremely large Christian population there. Islam will continue to spread southward during the colonial period as well. Colonialism, in fact, will contribute to the diffusion of Islam through the building of cities, increasing trade, and allowing Muslims to settle in new areas. So, Let's do a couple practice questions to finish up. Here's an image, Um, right? Remember I said sources might be visual as well. So the road Colossus, striding from Cape Town to Cairo. Mr. Rhodes had announced his intention to continue the telegraph northwards across the Zambesi to Uganda, then crossing the Sudan to complete the overland telegraph line from Cape Town to Cairo. Besides gaining access to raw materials, what was another reason nations like Britain and France colonized Africa during the 19th century?
British attitudes towards Africa expressed in this image are closest to their attitude towards what other region during the same period. What is a major difference between European colonization in the period 1450 to 1750 and European colonization in the era pictured above? So for your summary, explain how and why internal and external factors have influenced the process of state building in Africa from 1750 to 1900. If you have any questions, please ask. Thanks for listening. Have a great day.